in a series called The Storm-Tossed Family, and we've uh, covered different aspects of the family. We've looked at the power the, our, our family of origin has in our life and the inheritance and, and, and just the identity that we get from our family, but how Jesus died on the cross to give us a new identity and a new inheritance. We looked at some of the crazy, audacious things Jesus said about the family and what that means for us who are followers of Jesus and want to be his disciples. Uh, last week, if you were with us, we looked at the different role of husbands and wives and this beautiful picture of how marriage is, is an image of the gospel and God's love for us. And today we turn to the topic of sexuality. Now, a lot of people may wonder, well, what does sexuality have to do with marriage? Which I think would demonstrate kind of how far we've actually uh, moved from God's ideal. Um, because in our culture, we have, I, we've kind of divorced sexuality from family. It's its own little issue over here. But in God's view, Sexuality has always been connected to family in the context of one man and one woman in, the, in, in, in a marriage. And so let me just say, what I'm going to be sharing from the scriptures today are counterculture. Um, I believe that they are life-giving and beautiful and lead to uh, freedom and love and life and abundance, which is what God wants for us. I think it's what we want for us. But at the same time, it's, it's very counterculture, and we've all been influenced by the culture in which we live. Uh, and, and for that reason, um, the things that we hear um, could be difficult. Let me just say, though, that what I'm sharing today from Scripture is not Christian marketing. Um, it, it's not just trying to put the best face on Christianity, but it's basically saying, here is what God says. We think he has good reason for it. We think the evidence supports it, as well as, you know, the, the 2,000 years of, of, of human uh, church history. Um, but God isn't giving us what we necessarily want as much as what we need. And I know that whenever this topic comes up in church, a lot of Christians kind of lean in. They get really interested. Whenever we post this topic to, to YouTube, it gets more views than anything else. Because I, I have the suspicion that many Christians are just waiting for like the line to finally move or for someone to kind of find that loophole that's going to like change everything. And now we could just be like the culture and just, just kind of go all in. And if that's what you're hoping to hear today, I'm just going to invite you to the cross and to Jesus crucified and to find there everything that our hearts yearn for when we're actually chasing after everything that our culture is offering us. See, because while our culture changes and while cultural trends change and values change and actions change and while Supreme Court renders judgments and whatnot, the gospel does not change. We continue to have truth and we continue to have grace and we hold those things in tension. And so this is a culturally um, counterculture message. But more than that, it's a, it's a bit of an uncomfortable message for many people. Um, I'm going to be using this three-letter word a lot this morning. Um, and I know there are kids present and I apologize for that. But here's the deal I'll make with parents. I'm not going to define or describe the three-letter word. I'm going to leave you to do that, okay? And so you can deal with your kids when they say, what is that? You can share with them in age-appropriate ways what that actually is. And I do hope that this will lead to lots of discussions in families with parents and kids in age-appropriate ways because it is never too early to start in this culture to begin to have these conversations, again, in age-appropriate ways. So and, and if, if at any point you feel really awkward, like during this, like way uncomfortable during this talk, just put yourself in my shoes, okay? <laughs> and remember, I'm the one giving the talk. My mom, was, was, she was here for the first service. My sister was here. I mean, this is just really, really crazy. And so, but we got to talk about this because number one, the Bible has lots to say about sexuality. It talks about sexuality as being this beautiful gift from God that is given to man and woman in order to kind of demonstrate again God's love and oneness in, in, in the four. He's three, but you one, and now you got this two, and they're one. And it's beautiful, and it's enjoyable, it's a wonderful gift. And so the Bible has lots to say about it. But at the same time, the Bible also talks about how it can be very destructive, and it can be painful, and it can bring hurt and addiction and brokenness in us us when, you know, it is dealt with in ways that are outside of the bounds of what God would have for us. And that's another reason we have to talk about this, not only because the Bible talks about it, because if many of us, myself included, would be honest with ourselves, we would say some of our biggest regrets in life, some of the most painful experiences that we still carry with us, are a result 
of bad decisions we have made in the realm of sexuality. That we shouldn't have trusted that person who we trusted ourselves to, that we shouldn't have clicked on that link that we thought was just going to be a one-time thing and now has obsessed my life, that, that we shouldn't have gone there, but we did, we went there, and now we are carrying guilt and we are carrying shame and we are carrying brokenness and we're carrying regret all because of sexuality being expressed outside of what God intended it for. And so today we look at sexuality through the lens of the cross. Now, ever since sin entered our world, there have been two main ditches that we as humans fall into in the realm of our sexuality. And actually, our culture right now, we, we're, we're deep into both of them. And the one is to say that we trivialize sex, and the other is that we deify it. One says that it is nothing, and at the same time, we say it is everything. Right? And so the side that says it's nothing, that trivializes it, says, well, it's, it's nothing but a biological function. It's just two people coming together, no strings attached, no one gets hurt, no harm, no foul. It's just a hookup. Again, it's just two people enjoying each other, mutual consent, it's just like sharing a meal together. Nothing more than that. And then the other side that kind of deifies it would say, it is everything, and we need to pursue it with everything that, that we are, that we can't have life unless we have this in our lives actively, to the point that uh, many people who are in a stage of life where they are not sexually active feel like they are missing out on life. I have talked to many single people who have said to me, why should I put my life on hold just because I'm single, kind of making sex and life synonymous. It is as though it is everything, that I can't live without this in my life. And I, I get it. It's a strong drive. It's, we're made for connection with, with, I get all of that, but we no longer view our sexuality through the lens of the gospel, but we have made sexuality a gospel of its own. It has become the good news. It is that thing that gives us life and abundance and vitality and a sense of fulfillment and purpose and meaning. We pursue it as though it is a gospel, but it is a false gospel. And our culture right now is embracing both of those. It is nothing and it is everything and it leads to all kinds of problems when we have this view that it is nothing and it is simultaneously everything. But this is where the church in Corinth was as well 2,000 years ago. Corinth is a, a city in, in what is now um, Greece where in the first century it was kind of the, the hub of the, the Roman Empire which meant that uh, all kinds of ideas were coming through the city and, and merchandise and sports and arts. And at the time, there were two main ideas surrounding sexuality in Corinth and in the, the Roman world, really. And they could be broken down into these two things. Number one would be hedonism. Hedonism was the belief that the, the body and the soul were completely separated and that when we die... The body would go to the ground and be destroyed. The, the soul, the spirit would go to heaven and live forever. And the two weren't at all connected. So you could do anything you wanted with your body and it would not affect your spirit. So therefore, they would teach, you can have as many partners as you want with your body because when you die, your body is going into the ground. Your spirit is going to heaven. And so you can have as many partners, do whatever you want with your body. It's not going to affect your relationship with God or your spirit in the afterlife. That's hedonism. The other uh, counter idea in, in, in the Roman world at the time was asceticism, which would say, no, the, the body and the soul, yes, they are two different things, but they are intricately connected. And what you do with your body, your body, which is evil, all physical things are evil and bad, what you do with that affects your soul. And therefore, our purpose as humans is to kind of squelch all physical appetite. And that included food as well as sex, which meant that the ascetics we're claiming that people should live celibate lives, even including married people, to just avoid all sexual activity. So these are the two views that were going on in Corinth 2,000 years ago. And there was a church there, a, a, a group of Christians, much like us, trying to navigate this complex culture, telling them different things about sex and, and marriage and singleness and, and how do we navigate this. And so they wrote a letter to the Apostle Paul, who they knew very well. Paul had lived there for several years. And so they wrote this letter with a bunch of questions. And so Paul wrote the book that we have in the New Testament called 1 Corinthians as a result of these issues and these questions that the Christians in Corinth asked. 
And what he does is in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he addresses the hedonism worldview. And in the first portion of chapter 7, he addresses the asceticism. And in chapter 6, he addresses kind of uh, the destructive patterns of sexuality. And in 1 Corinthians 7, he addresses uh, the more normative and, and God-blessed um, function of, of our sexuality. So let's jump into 1 Corinthians 6 and look at what he says regarding hedonism. 1 Corinthians 6, he says this. He quotes uh, them. He says, everything is permissible for me, end quote, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, end quote, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So what is he talking about? Well, here he quotes two of the main slogans, the, 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 the truths that the Corinthians believed that they were using to justify their hedonism. And number one was, everything is permissible for me. That's what they were saying. Because my body is going into the ground, my spirit's going to heaven, I could do whatever I want. And the Christians would then say, yeah, we could do whatever we want too because Jesus died for our sins. We are under grace. Whatever we do, he will forgive us. And so we could do whatever we want. Everything is permissible for me. It's much like, again, how we as the church in, in America have been influenced by our culture to believe everything is permissible. Uh, a study was done by Christian Mingle, which is an online dating site for Christians, when they asked Christians between the age of 18 and 59, would you or will you have sex before marriage? 63% said yes, of Christians, 63%, which says that we have become a church of sexual atheists. That we believe in God, but we don't believe he has anything to say about our bodies or how we live our lives in relationship to one another or sexually, that we are free to do whatever we want. Jesus may have said this. Paul might have said that. The Bible might have said that. But that doesn't count for us anymore. We can do what we want because everything is permissible. We are taking the same bait that Eve took in the Garden of Eden in, in, in Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent said to her, did God really say, don't eat the fruit? Did he really say that? Causing us to question God's word. That was his original temptation, and he continues to bring it. We forget the words of Jesus who said, why do you call me Lord? And do not do what I ask you to do. When it comes down to it, we as Christians, we need to decide, do we trust God or not? Because as you look at how we're living our lives and relating to sexuality in our culture, it looks like we don't trust God has our best interest in mind that he doesn't really want us to live, that he's trying to withhold something good from us, which is why he's given us all of these kind of restrictions. We believe, because of our lack of faith, that everything is permissible for me. But Paul counters that way of thinking by saying, well, everything may be permissible, but not everything is beneficial, and I will not be mastered by anything. In other words, as we kind of give in to sexual temptation, Paul is saying not only will it hurt us, but it will master us. Not everything is beneficial. It will hurt us. And I will not be mastered by anything. We will be mastered by it. And many of us could probably tell stories, again, about mistakes we have made, things that we have done outside of God's will that have brought pain, things that have brought consequences that we're still dealing with. But more than that, we also know that when we give in to sexual temptation, it begins to master us. Whenever we feed any appetite, it doesn't go away. It simply grows. You know, if I eat a lot of sugary, fatty foods, what am I going to crave? Sugary, fatty foods, yeah? And in the same way, when I begin to feed those appetites, they just grow. Oh, I'm just going to click on this one, one image, this one time. I just want to see one picture. What's everybody talking about? But what it does, it begins to feed an insatiable appetite. There is no picture that is naked enough that is going to finally satisfy your soul. You can keep looking and keep looking. But all it's going to do is continue to feed the desire for more, and that is how pornography becomes an addiction. Or the young couple that says, we're just going to experiment sexually once, thinking it'll just be once, but we're fooling ourselves because once we awaken those appetites, they are awake, and it's very hard to put them back to sleep again, and they begin to master us. 
This is what Paul is saying. You know, you may think you could do whatever you want with your body, but there are consequences, painful consequences as well as we get mastered. Then he goes on to this other slogan that the, the hedonists in Corinth were continually quoting. They would say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. In other words, we could eat whatever we want. We could eat as much as we want because when we die, our bodies go back to the grave and we, our spirit goes to heaven. And so we could do whatever we want with our body. And this counts for our sexuality as well. And now Paul begins to argue against that using the truth of the gospel of the crucified Christ, the the God who would love us so much that he would go to the cross for us, that he would rise again, that he's preparing a place for us, that he would live within us. He says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body, that, that we are to live for him and he is living in us. He begins to unpack this in the next verse where he says, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. So what he's saying here to the hedonists is, no, your body doesn't go into the ground and stay there. Jesus was raised in bodily form. You will be raised in bodily form. Therefore, we have to be concerned about what happens with our body, right? Our bodies will actually inherit heaven. He goes on to say, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself, that we are connected to Jesus? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. So what is he talking about here? Well, in the city of Corinth, over, there was a hill overlooking the city where the temple of Aphrodite was situated. Aphrodite was the goddess of sensual love. And so in that temple were, ancient writers tell us, a thousand temple priestesses who were served as prostitutes. And so people could go and as an act of worship spend time with the prostitute. Many in the church were beginning to do this. And Paul can't believe it. He says, can we join the members of Christ with a prostitute. And he says, never. And we would say, well, hey, I'm not doing that. I'm not like with a, I'm just with my girlfriend. I'm just, you know, I'm with my boyfriend. You know, we love each other. We're committed to each other. You know, it's okay for us because we're not with a prostitute. But Paul's going to argue, you have to understand what is the purpose of our sexuality. He says in the next verse, he says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body or with anyone. He, he or she who unites himself with anyone is one with them in body. For it is said, he quotes Genesis chapter 2 here, the two will become one flesh. This great mystery. And he's talking about this is the reason God gave us sexuality. This is the reason for the gift. It is to become like a super glue for the soul. That when one man and one woman come together and they, they date and they get to know one another and they investigate whether they may be compatible and whether they want to maybe uh, take things further in terms of being together longer. And then they, they, they fall in love. And once they fall in love, they realize, wow, I love you so much that I am willing to be with you even when you put on weight and get wrinkles and lose your hair and lose your attractiveness and you slow down you begin to bend over, I will still love you because that's how attracted I am to you. Once a couple gets to that point, which takes a while, then they say, all right, we are willing to stand before God and before our church and before our family and covenant before them that we will be together till death do us part. At that point, Couples are then ready to then enter into the sexual union that will then seal them together, the superglue of the soul that will mesh two people and two souls and two futures into one forever, right? That is the purpose of sex. That's what Paul is saying. That's what Genesis 2 says. That's what Jesus says. But what happens is when we kind of, kind of enter into that before we're at the altar, what happens when we go with multiple partners is that our souls are enmeshed, our our persons are enmeshed, our futures are enmeshed, and though we break up, we continue to carry those people with us. We may say we've broken up, but we haven't broken up. We're carrying a part of them with us. And then when we eventually do get married, we wonder why we have trust issues and we wonder why we have other issues because we got more than just me and you in this relationship. We got every one of our partners and your partners and their partners are all right here. And so Paul is saying, why would a follower of Jesus who is united to him do this? You are, you, you are destroying your opportunity for um, a happy sexual life as well as limiting your own joy and freedom. So what does he say we should do? Flee from sexual immorality. Flee. 
from sexual immorality. You know, we don't want to flee from it. We want to know where the line is so we can get as close to the line. Just tell me what I can't do, and I'm going to do everything up to that line. But Paul's saying, no, stay away from the line. Flee from it. You are dabbling with dynamite. You are dabbling with fire. He says, flee from it. Run as fast as you can. Why? He gives two reasons why. First of all, because sexual sin is different from other sins. He says, all other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So in other words, when I sin financially or with my words, that's sin. But the consequences don't follow me as long as sexual sin does. When I sin sexually, that's a sin against my own body, which means that while I can be forgiven instantly like any other sin, and I can be right with God, that doesn't mean that the consequences don't continue to follow me. The pain and the shame and the brokenness and the anger that I feel because of what happened continues to follow me. Sometimes the consequences last for life. So Paul is saying, flee from that. And the second reason he tells us to flee, again, is rooted in the gospel. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, whom you have received from God? God lives in you. You are not your own. You were bought at a price through the blood of Christ, poured out on Calvary. Therefore, honor God with your body. So what Paul is saying is, God intends something so much more for you. He has come to live inside of you. He wants to guide your life. He wants to empower your life. He bought your life for eternity so that you could be with him. Therefore, because of the gospel, because of Jesus' love for you, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from sex outside of marriage. Flee from pornography. Flee from extramarital affairs. Flee. He's telling us to flee. He's telling the hedonists to flee, and he's rooting it all in the gospel. Next, he goes on to those who would be in the asceticist camp. And he's going to talk to those who would say that we should all strive for celibacy, even within the context of marriage. Now, before we read the passage in in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1 through 5, let me just warn you, this is not the Song of Solomon. It it, it does not read like romantic poetry. It's a little kind of like matter of fact and not really romantic, but... That's not what it's intended to be. Just know, this is not like date night reading. This is not like what a couple would take into the room, you know, at night before they go to bed to to get in the mood. No, this is intended to refute the asceticists, those who would claim celibacy even in marriage. Okay, so let's just keep that in mind as we read this. What What does he say? Let's take a look at the passage. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. End quote. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband in the same way. The husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Okay, again, not the most romantic thing that you've ever heard. But what is Paul saying? Well, let's go back and we see, he says, now for the matters you wrote about. Again, this was a question that they they had written to Paul about. They said, give us some feedback on this. And one of the questions, one of the things that they had written was this quote that he includes. They had written to him, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Like, right? And Paul would say, right, if you're talking about two people who are married. I'm all for celibacy in that case. But for those who are married, for a husband and wife, No, I don't agree. Actually, husbands and wives should enjoy the gift that God has given them. He has implanted sexuality in them. He has given them a sex drive. He has brought them together. They have covenanted together. They are the only legitimate expression of their sexuality that the other has. Therefore, Paul would say and God would say, husband, here's your wife. Wife, here's your husband. Have at it. Enjoy one another. This is what Paul is talking about where he says, that the wife's body does not belong to her and the husband's body does not belong to him, but they belong to each other. And this doesn't mean that husbands and wives make demands on each other or lord it over each other, you know, woman, you're, you're mine, or, you know, whatever that would look like. But it means that we realize that we have a stewardship to be responsible for. That God has put us together for the purpose of growing in love and and demonstrating God's love for us. 
and that we would learn to talk about sexuality in the context of marriage. We would learn what the other uh, desires, what, how, how to serve them. Because that's what sex in the context of a marriage is all about. It's about service. And when we look at it this way, in covenantal love, then monogamy and fidelity, they don't restrict sexual freedom, but rather they fuel it. You know, we have this impression from our culture that these ideas from the Bible are restrictive, that they're keeping us from something, that is keeping us from freedom. But when you experience covenantal relationship between a husband and a wife, it actually brings freedom and fidelity. I'll try to explain. Our our, our culture uh, communicates the idea, and you can listen to any number of commercials on this, but that sex is about performance. How are you performing, men? Are you ashamed of your performance? Get this medicine right? Or whatever is, is going on. And I'm not against the medicines or whatever, whatever you need. But it, the idea is that it's about performance. But in the context of covenantal relationships, sex is not about performance. Because when it's about performance, then we worry about our performance. We have shame about our performance. Did I not perform? We're always wondering, is our relationship conditional on my performance? What if I don't perform? Do we still love each other? But in a covenantal relationship, when we have said, till death do us part, I realize that My love for my wife and my wife's love for me is not based on my performance, nor is it based on my attractiveness or my physique or anything else. It's based on love, a commitment. I don't love my wife because I find her attractive, which I do. But I find my wife attractive because I love her. Because I love her, she has become the standard of beauty for me. And, and so I, I, she knows she doesn't have to keep up with actresses and models. I know I don't have to keep up with rock stars and movie stars, right? That we are going to continue to love each other until death do us part. We are committed. That doesn't mean we let ourselves go. We know what the other finds attractive and we strive toward that. But we know that our love for one another is not conditional on performance or attractiveness or physique or what size or how many wrinkles that we have. And that brings incredible freedom to serve one another without fear of failure or fear of shame. It takes us back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 2, where the author writes, they were naked before each other and they had no shame. Paul concludes this passage in verse 5 by saying this, Do not deprave each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Again, not the most beautiful um, poetic writing again. But what Paul is telling us here is that sex in the context of marriage is not only a gift from God, but it is also a weapon. Not the kind of weapon you're thinking about, like, oh, I'm going to use this against my spouse. No, it is a weapon against sexual immorality. That, that Paul knows, the Bible knows, uh, that you know, God knows that he has implanted this drive within us, men and women, and that it is strong, and that if there is a long period of deprivation, that it may lead to temptation. And so he says, don't do that. Don't deprive each other because it may lead to temptation. Now, that's not to say that all sexual sin in the context of marriage is because of deprivation. Typically, it's not because of that. It's usually because of the brokenness in the person who is sinning. But deprivation, Paul is saying, can lead to temptation. Therefore, don't deprive each other except for a short period of time when both consent and then come back together and use it as a weapon against sexual immorality. And finally, he says it's a weapon also against couples drifting apart. From the very beginning, Satan has worked to drive a wedge between husbands and wives using shame and conflict. He did it with Adam and Eve. He still does it in every marriage today. Shame and conflict. There's plenty of it to go around. Any married person will tell you, it's in my marriage. But when a couple, a man and a wife, come together in union, they again reaffirm their oneness. And as a couple clings to each other, shame is dissolved conflict dissipates and a couple remembers that they belong to each other. That God has brought them together and that they are one. As someone very wise in my small group said this week, the best remedy for an argument is 
You fill in the blank. So, the best way, according to Paul and the Bible and Jesus, to have a healthy sex life is to keep it in the confines of marriage, to serve one another, to talk about it, to know what the other likes, to be committed to, to one another despite what happens till death do us part, and to enjoy one another in that context and to find freedom and love in that context. So let's wrap this up by just looking at this question. How can we view our sexuality through the lens of the cross? Let me just share a couple things, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Number one, we have to understand that what we do with our bodies reveals what we believe about the gospel. What I mean by that is that if I truly believe that God has my best interest in mind, that he's not trying to keep something from me, but he has something for me, then I will believe that the, what he says about sexuality is for my, my good. It's for the abundant life. It is for the life that he died to give me. But if I believe that he's trying to withhold something from me and, 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 and go where he doesn't want me to go, that's demonstrating what I believe about the gospel. As Russell Moore uh, writes in his book, The Storm Tossed Family, he says, God warns us against sexual immorality and distortion, not because God wishes to restrict us from pleasure. This is the satanic suggestion of Genesis 3. Again, the, the, the serpent talking to Eve saying, did God really say? But because God knows how sex flourishes and how sex can destroy. Do I believe that? Do I trust God? Second thing I would say is at the cross, we see the price of our sexual sin. I see the price of my sexual sin at the cross. You know, again, our culture tells us it doesn't matter as long as it's two consenting adults. Nobody gets hurt, no harm, no foul. And we can, we can easily believe that. But if we want to know the face of sexual sin, we look at the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus became sin. He became sexual immorality on the cross. He became my sexual sin on the cross. And so if I want to know what it looks like, all I need to do is look at Jesus being flogged and spit on and mocked, being nailed to a cross, crying out, separated from his father in incredible agony, eventually dying, the eternal God dying, because that is what sin looks like. My sin is the reason he had to go there. Therefore, that's what my sin looks like. It is gory, and it's not pretty. But at the same time, we also know that at the cross, we see that the price of our sin has been paid, and we could all be forgiven. Every one of us has sexual brokenness in us. Uh, Jesus made it clear that even when we have a lustful thought that we have already committed adultery. So who among us is without sin? We all are broken, and we all need forgiveness. And as we come to the foot of the cross, and as we, we go to Jesus, and we accept what he gives us, we can made, be made completely clean, forgiven, pure. But that doesn't happen automatically. We need to be willing to confess our sin. We need to be willing to repent and turn away from it, and turn to Jesus, and open ourselves to his spirit, to come and live inside of us, to give us the power to live the life he wants us to live. So we could all be forgiven, and I hope that we all accept his forgiveness. Whatever our past looks like, whatever baggage, whatever shame, whatever brokenness we're carrying, that we could just come to the cross today and receive the forgiveness to receive the new start Jesus wants to give us. And then finally, I would just say this, that we take, to, to view our sexuality through the cross, we take our sexuality to the cross and crucify it with Christ to find freedom. What do I mean by that? I mean, again, our culture tells us that sex is nothing and that it is everything. And I take that to Jesus. I take that to the cross, this idea that, oh, it's nothing. And and, and I allow Jesus to crucify that and tell me, no, it is something. It is something special. It is something beautiful that I created for married people to enjoy. It is something. But yet I take that idea that it is everything. I take that to the cross. He says, no, it's not everything. There are more important things in your life than your sexuality. And if you try to make it everything, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And as I bring that to Jesus, he sets me free from it and gives me the ability to really live free. Again, in the words of Russell Moore, sex is not the ultimate experience. Sex is good, but it's not the only thing in your life. Knowing this can enable you, if married, to please your spouse sexually and be content in that union. Knowing this can enable you, if single, to channel your sexual desires towards service toward others. And we'll talk more about that as we come to singleness in a few weeks. But in either case, a cross-shaped sexuality can give us the power to fight temptation and the power to find joy in the moment without clamoring from some sensation we fear we might miss. So what are you going to do with this? You can just, you know, write it off. um, Or you can lean into it and, 
That's your choice. I would love uh, for you to lean in and, and just accept what Jesus wants to give you, abundant life, new life, eternal life. And um, I would love it if you just, on your decision card, let us know kind of how we can serve you, whether it's by praying for you, if you're wrestling with any of this, you have a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. It's one of our highlights of my weeks is praying over the requests that come in every week and just lifting them to the Father. Under the next steps, if you've said yes to Jesus today, you want to receive that new life or you want to be baptized to demonstrate that, I would encourage you to check that next step. But if you would just like to follow Jesus I would encourage you just to write the word follow Jesus in the comment box to follow him in your sexuality. You know, um, Kim and I had the opportunity to visit Corinth a couple of years ago. And as we were there, that hill overlooking um, the city where that temple of Aphrodite was situated, the ruins are still there. But scholars tell us that every night the, the priestesses, the prostitutes would come down that hill and, and they would come into the town to try and entice people back up the hill and into the temple. And they would wear these sandals. And on the bottom of the sandal was an inscription in Greek that was the one word that says, follow me. So that as they would walk through the city, they would leave this inscription in the sand with their sandals, follow me. Follow me. Follow me to sexual temptation. Follow me to a painful end. And it just strikes me that Jesus is saying the same thing today to every one of us. Right? Follow me. And if you'd like to follow him, I'd like to pray for you. Lord God, thank you for this gift that you have given us. And we want to pray that um, we would treat it with sacredness, but not as everything. God, we pray that wherever we are with this, whether it's dealing with shame and brokenness and pain, or trying to figure out what this means for me as a teenager, trying to navigate this culture and the complexity of it, whether it means a married couple that's still trying to figure out what intimacy and shamelessness looks like, God, we pray that your spirit would guide us and provide for us. Jesus, we pray that you would bring forgiveness for the sins of our past, for the brokenness of our past, that you would wash us clean by the blood you shed at Calvary, and that you would fill us with your spirit so that we could live a life for you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.